Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Thank you for joining with me today. I hope that you know that uh, we don't have a ton of people that watch these um, uh, online pre-recorded sermons that we have available on YouTube, um, but we do know there's a few people that this is what works best for us to be able to share uh, this way with them. And so we want you to know that we appreciate each one of you that watches this, um, that listens to this video, however you do it, um, that we appreciate you. And if there's ever a way that we can be a blessing to you, feel free to reach out and to let us know. Let me pray for our time together as we get started. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your faithfulness and goodness. I thank you for this time to talk about your word. I pray that you would guide and direct me as I teach. May you bless us all that we might be understanding your word more and more and growing in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Did you know that Albert Einstein once said, Genius is taking the complex and making it simple. I like that idea. And I believe we'll see that in our passage for today. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. So we're wrapping up our series on faith with one last faith passage. And for our last sermon, I thought it would be good to end with an interesting request that the disciples have for Jesus. Actually, let's start with that in verse 5 of Luke 17, where we read this. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now, without considering the rest of verses around verse 5, let me ask you this. What do you think of that request? Well, it's interesting, right? But it also demands context, doesn't it? Like if they had asked this at the moment when Jesus calmed the storm while they were afraid, and Jesus said, oh, you of little faith, then it seems like it would have been very specifically talking about helping them to not struggle with trusting him in the midst of a difficult situation. But that's not the context. So I think it's important for us to consider the context of the request. Now, before we do that, let me just say that sometimes our Bibles impact our understanding of context a little bit because of the way that chapters and verses have been separated and, and subheadings have been put in place. But we need to remember that those were added later. Actually, the Bible was not separated into chapters until the 1200s. And verse designations were not added until about 300 years after that. So those constructs impacted our understanding of context because the breaks caused us to see them as a place where a story or conversation is ended and a new thing has begun. But in reality, those verses break, those verse breaks sometimes come in the middle of a sentence or a thought. And the chapter breaks sometimes come in the middle of a conversation or a story. So it's good for us to remember that they were added later as devices to help us find and refer to different portions of Scripture. But another element that was added later even further impacts our understanding of context. At the risk of getting into the weeds, I want to introduce you to a, a word that you may or may not be familiar with. It is the word pericope. It is a Greek word that most literally means cutting around, and it's used in biblical study to refer to a section of verses that are meant to be read together. Now, we often use the word passage maybe to speak of those kinds of sections. And if we look at our Bibles, we will find that the publisher of that particular Bible has divided the text into pericopes or sections with subheadings for each section. Now, by looking at different versions, we can easily see that those section breaks and subheadings are not universal. Each publisher chooses where to put a break and how to title it. So that impacts our understanding of context because we tend to refer to a passage of Scripture often simply based upon the version that we're reading and where they put the breaks and what they chose to title them as if that provides the context. Now, we need to remember that those were not originally part of Scripture, and while they may be helpful, they can also impact our understanding of context. For instance, this passage in my ESV version of the Bible separates out verses 1 to 4 with one subheading, then verses 5 to 6 with another, and then verses 7 to 10 as a third. Other versions have the entire 10 verses together under one subheading. And actually, if we track back, we find that these 10 verses come at the end of what appears to be a lengthy conversation of teaching from Jesus, or at least a compilation of his teachings that seems to begin at the, in chapter 15. 
And it starts with this crowd gathering around Jesus. And Luke specifically mentions that in addition to the disciples, the crowd included tax collectors and sinners. And there were Pharisees and scribes who were there who were complaining because Jesus was associating with those sinners. Which then launched Jesus into three successive parables about the celebration over the lost being found. And then he turned to his disciples and shared a story about a dishonest manager, which ended with instruction about being faithful with little and how the love for money can get in the way of love for God. Which then prompted the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, to jump back into the conversation by ridiculing Jesus. And then Jesus went on to talk about the law and the kingdom of God and about divorce. And then a really interesting story about the rich man and Lazarus, which we don't have time to get into right now. But all of that conversation leads us to chapter 17, which comes after new subheading, but appears to be part of this same overall conversation. With that in mind, let's pick things up with verse 1. And he said to his disciples, Temptations of sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and he were cast into the sea, than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So what do you think of what Jesus is talking about here? Well, as standalone verses, we can see that Jesus was addressing temptation and sin, but specifically from the perspective of the one who is a conduit for sin. Now, the wording there actually refers to something like a trap or a stumbling block. Not just someone who is sinning themselves, but someone who is actually providing an avenue for others to sin or tempting or causing others to sin. Then he uses the strong illustration with the idea of a millstone, uh, which is a very heavy stone used for grinding grain, and, and as if that millstone would be tied upon the person's neck and they would be cast into the sea. Now, can you imagine what that would be like? It would be an excruciating death, and Jesus is saying that it would be better for that person to have that happen to them than if they caused a little one to sin. And then in verses 3 and 4, it almost seems like Jesus changes direction a little bit. He's still talking about sin, but in these two verses, his focus is more on their response toward someone, and specifically toward a brother, who sins against them. In general, it seems like the focus in verses 3 and 4 is about dealing with the brother who sins, and Jesus tells them to rebuke when needed, but also to forgive. Now, overall, I think the emphasis is on the idea of restoration, like rebuking those who are going the wrong direction to help them come back to where they're supposed to be, while at the same time showing grace and maintaining unity within the body. Now, with that in mind, let me also point out that verse 1 says that Jesus was saying all of this to his disciples. Now, I think this is where it's important for us to remember context and to look beyond the subheading. Remember, this is part of the overall conversation where Luke had specifically mentioned the Pharisees, now, the way that I picture this conversation is that Jesus was talking to this greater crowd that had a whole bunch of different people in it. And at some points, he was speaking directly to the Pharisees, while other times he was speaking to his disciples, while knowing that the Pharisees are right there as well. And I think this is an important part of the context because I believe Jesus was warning his disciples not just how to handle sin and temptation in general, but also in their role as religious leaders. As we look at Jesus' time here on earth, his message was focused on love and grace, and his harsh words were reserved for the religious leaders of the day. And Jesus knows that when the time arrives, these disciples will be, would become the new religious leaders, and he wanted them to be different. Actually, if we track back to the previous couple of chapters, we see Jesus' heart for the lost, the outcasts, the sinners, and the poor. Even here, the idea of little ones seems to suggest a particular attention to the needs of those who are often overlooked. And what leads to the disciples' request, and all of that leads to the disciples' request in verse 5, where they say, increase our faith. So in light of what we just talked about, does that impact how we understand their request? Well, to some extent, it seems like this request comes out of left field. I mean, it seems like this would have fit better at one of those moments where Jesus had rebuked them for their lack of faith, but that's not what's happening here. It could be that they were reacting to verse 4, where Jesus was calling them to continually forgive those who have sinned against them, because that seems like a daunting task. But I think it's more than that. I would imagine that at times, following Jesus was overwhelming. I'm sure it would have been incredible to have an upfront seat 
for all the miracles and teachings and to see the way people flock to, to Jesus and to listen to the way that he gracefully navigated the test of the Pharisees and taught with authority and just what he demonstrated in every situation. But while all of that would have been amazing, it probably also at times left them feeling overwhelmed, inadequate, unworthy, unqualified, intimidated. Have you ever felt like that? I think their request comes from that place. And I think that maybe what they were hoping for was for Jesus to just pass, wave his hand over them and for them to receive a new level of faith and confidence and spiritual maturity. And I get that. But that's not how Jesus responded to the request. Actually, he didn't even really give them a suggestion about how to grow in faith. Instead, he gave them a piece of information and then a story. Now, let's take a look. First of the piece of information he gave them in verse 6. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, we actually talked about this a little bit back in May, as we looked at another time when Jesus used a similar phrase to this. But the context there was different. So for today, I want us to consider this statement in the context of what we've been talking about with this passage. What do you think Jesus is saying to them in this moment? Well, like I said, Jesus didn't just wave his hand and give them more faith, nor did he say, don't worry, your faith is enough, nor did he give them instruction about how to grow in faith. Instead, he told them with even just a little bit of faith, they could see the impossible become possible. Now, I think he's pointing out that it's not about having some big, audacious, amazing faith. It's not about the amount of their faith at all. It's about the incredible power of God. Jesus is taking their eyes off of themselves and off of their level of faith and instead putting their eyes back on God. It's not how much faith you have, but who you have faith in. That's the first part, the piece of information. And then he gives them a story. Look at the story in verses 7 to 10. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you are commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Okay, so considering what we talked about with context and pericopes and all that, do you think these verses connect with the disciples' request in verse 5? Or should I have stopped with verse 6? It's a tough question, right? Well, at first glance, it seems like maybe the story doesn't fit with verses 5 and 6. But here's my thinking. If we go down to verse 11, we see a very natural break that comes there. And the way that Jesus so naturally moves into the story after what he said in verse 6, if, I, if it didn't have the next subheading there in my version of the Bible, it would sure look like it was meant to be together. And so it seems like this is still part of that same conversation, tracking back to chapter 15. So I would consider it with that context in mind. Now, we need to recognize that Jesus is talking about the relationship between a master and a servant within the context of an audience that would have understood that dynamic very well and in ways that we would not today. Regardless of what we think of servanthood or slavery and, and, and our bias, our current bias or understanding of what that means, the original audience would have easily understood this dynamic. And they would have known that when a servant came in from working in the field, he would then continue his role caring for the master inside the house, not expecting the tables to be turned and the master to owe him and serve him in some way because of the work he had done. And when the day was over, the servant would not have expected a thank you, but would have recognized that he had just performed the duties he was responsible for doing. Okay, so that's an interesting story, but what were the disciples to think of that in light of the context we've been talking about? Remembering back to the overall context of the conversation, there was this interplay between Jesus talking with his disciples while having the Pharisees and everyone else listening in. And overall, he's been calling them to be different, right? And one of the problems Jesus pointed out with the Pharisees over at different times was their pride. They thought they had obeyed the rules, kept the covenant, done what they were supposed to do, and they considered themselves superior, like they had earned something or deserved something. And they had risen to these positions of religious authority and had taken the opportunity to lord it over others as if it was a position of power. But Jesus condemned them for that, for, and, and he called his followers to be different than them. He wanted them to be humble servants like he was. He wanted them to recognize that they have not earned their position or accomplished something that deserves a ward, but to recognize that they are imperfect and have been shown grace that they didn't earn. He wants them to look at their lives like servants, 
servants of God, servants of one another, humble, gracious, loving, like Jesus, and like the servant in the story. Which then brings us to the overall question. If all of this goes together and provides context for the request in verse 5 for Jesus to increase their faith, when we put verse 6 together with verses 7 to 10, Jesus answers their request in a very different way than we would expect. So overall, why? With this context in mind, what do you think of this request for Jesus to increase their faith and Jesus' response and what we can learn from it for ourselves? Well, I felt led to end our series on faith with this passage because of this request. Increase our faith. It just seems like a verse, a statement, a phrase that belongs in a series on faith. And I think that this is something that all of us would like to ask at some time, at different times in our lives. Not just for Jesus to increase our faith in a moment or for a particular outcome, but overall to deal with our feelings of inadequacy and imperfections and general spiritual anxiety in our faith journey. And I think typically when we ask Jesus to increase our faith, our expectation or hope is that he would just wave his hand and supernaturally give us faith and confidence and spiritual maturity. But instead we find a response like this. Now, when I read this, I think Jesus is taking this great complex thing called faith and making it a little more simple. I think he's helping us understand that the amount of faith we have is not really the issue. Our faith is not in ourselves or in our ability to have faith. It is in the Lord. We don't have to worry about what we can or can't do or how well we will be able to follow him. Our faith is in God. and With him, all things are possible. We're not called to some kind of incredible, amazing faith journey that defies explanation or is demonstrated with some grand display. We don't earn our salvation. We don't deserve what we've been given. We're called to simply fix our eyes on God, to trust him, and to follow him as humble servants. And that's what I take for our, from our passage for today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opening our eyes and helping us to know you. Help us to live out this faith journey, following you, trusting in you as humble servants. In Jesus' name, amen.